Welcome to the monthly Wigo Women Voters of the Elgin Area Issues Program. We've been offering these programs since April. Uh, we offer them via Zoom and YouTube on the second Wednesday of the month. We've been doing this, like I said, since last April. Our goal is to inform League members, but also the public. I can't hear you, Jennifer. Sorry, Jennifer, you're still muted. I was trying to get everybody muted and I accidentally clicked you. Welcome to the monthly of the League of Women Voters of the Elgin Area Issues Programs. We've been offering these programs via Zoom uh, and YouTube and we've been doing them on the second Wednesday of the month ever since April. Our goal is to inform league members about issues, but also the general public about things in which we think you might be concerned. Some of these programs offer an opportunity to take action to solve the problems. Last month, we learned about the plight of sex trafficking victims. Tonight, we're offering a related program on missing and murdered indigenous women. MMIW, if you're familiar with that uh, term. As with last month, we are co-sponsoring this event with the American Association of University Women Elgin Branch and the Long Red Line. Organizations with which we network, uh, with whom we work on current problems. For more information on any of these organizations, uh, certainly feel free to go to our Facebook or our, um, our web pages and join us or learn more about us. Rather than me add any other comments, I was going to introduce Ramona Burns, a community social activist, uh, to introduce our speakers. She is the current chair of Long Led the Line. Uh, Moni, are you here yet? Okay, so I'm going to wing it. Excuse me, because I wasn't prepared to be the introducer. I thought that Moni was gonna do this. So tonight who we're introducing are Chelsea, and am I saying it right, Trio? a program coordinator with Sovereign Bodies Institute and Jacqueline Bissonnette, uh, Sovereign Bodies Institute. Uh, these people have built on indigenous traditions of data gathering and knowledge transfer to create, disseminate, and put into action research on gender and sexual violence against indigenous people. So our program is actually called Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls About the Dark. So I guess I'm going to let either Chelsea or Jacqueline uh, begin the program since Moni isn't here to be your leader. How have you guys worked this out? Hello, my name is Jacqueline Bissonnette. I'll be introducing myself and then Chelsea will introduce themselves. Sorry about uh, Ramona not being able to uh, log on right now. She's at my family home. Uh, we live out on the reservation and the um, internet is really bad out there. Um, so um, my name is Jacqueline Bissonnette, Manahu Itabua, Inaniane Jacqueline Bissonnette, Bishop Iwapo, Iga Manahua, Payahunaduwe. So my name is Jacqueline Bissonnette. I am Numa, Newa, and Oglala Lakota. I am from the Paiute tribe, Shoshone, and Sioux. Um, I am from Bishop, California, which we called Payahunaduwe, which means the land of the flowing water. I graduated from Humboldt State University in Arcata, California in May of 2021 with a master's degree in social work in indigenous and rural communities. My research was focused on the Indian Child Welfare Act, the child welfare system, and the intersectionality of intergenerational trauma and missing and murdered indigenous peoples. Um, as soon as I was, um, as soon as I was finished with school, or while I was in school, um, I began researching missing and murdered Indigenous peoples, and it really um, brought me to Sovereign Bodies Institute, which is a organization that uh, Chelsea will talk more about. Um, I am an advocate for inherent rights to sovereignty, clean water, tra traditional foodways, to regain ancestral knowledge, 
to recover land, to integrate cultural healing from colonialism. And I'm dedicated to help in the healing process of indigenous communities oppressed by violence and trauma. I myself am a survivor of violence in my personal background, studies, culture, educational foundations, life perspective, and compassion have helped to shape and center my practice. I'd like to introduce my uh, colleague. Uh, this is Chelsea, and she will be introducing herself, or they will be introducing themselves. Thanks, Jacqueline. Hello, everyone. Good to meet you virtually, those that I can see. Um, I, it's, I just want to say it's pretty cool to talk to folks from Chicago. Uh, I, I come from a few tribes in what's now called the Philippine Islands, uh, but I'm from a couple of islands out there in Mindanao and in Mont Blanc. Um, and my mother was actually uh, the first generation in her family to come out uh, to the United States and she was born in Chicago. And so it feels really nice to be with other folks from, from her uh, literal homeland. <laughs> so thank you for uh, letting me be here today to join Jacqueline in this conversation. Um, yeah, so like I said, uh, I come from Mindanao uh, of what is colonially known as the Philippines. Um, I grew up in uh, California and I'm currently in Wiat territory, which is Northern California. Um, I came out here for grad school. I graduated from the same program as Jacqueline a couple years before her. Um, so my emphasis was also decolonizing social work uh, with an emphasis on missing and murdered indigenous peoples. Um, I specifically looked at extractive industries and the relation between extractive industries and violence against indigenous peoples, including my own peoples in my homelands of Mindanao. Um, I'm also a survivor of multiple things that uh, uh, many indigenous peoples are survivors of. And that is what has guided me in um, wanting to be a part of addressing gender and sexual violence against indigenous peoples. Uh, I've been involved in that work for almost a decade, but specifically with missing and murdered indigenous peoples, um, I've been doing work for about five or six years. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about later, like what that work looked like, what kind of relationships and uh, prevention intervention and like uh, advocacy work that, that I did specifically. <clears throat> specifically. Um, but outside of missing and murdered indigenous peoples, uh, I do work locally with my community out here. I'm, I'm trans, actually I'm trans uh, non-binary and I do a lot of work with queer and trans, uh, black indigenous and POC people out here. Uh, anywhere from like mutual aid, uh, fire, fire response work to um, non-reproductive and reproductive doula work. Uh, and so those are kind of a few of my passions, but I appreciate uh, the chance to be here. I see that Moni joined. I'm not sure if Moni wanted to say anything before we get into the topic. I just want to say welcome and I just appreciate you two uh, joining us and doing your presentation for the league and for AAW and of course the work that you guys have been doing with the Long Run Line. Um, so no, uh, anytime away, please continue. Jacqueline, I'm not sure if you wanted to kind of set set the space um, since we'll be talking about some pretty serious things or. Um, I thought that we could um, start out with a MMIP 101, but before we did that, yeah. My bad. Before we did that, I would like to start us off with a prayer. Um, in our um, cultural ways, we'd like to start off um, when we talk about sacred things like uh, the work of MMIPs and how we help our families be like to us. Uh, say a prayer. Say a prayer for those. Let me grab my lighter. Okay. I'm not gonna grab my lighter. I think it's out in my. I think it's outside. So I have some um, sweet grass right here. Pretend that I lit it. Okay, I'm gonna say a prayer for everybody. Oh, Creator, 
We thank you for this day. We thank you for this circle. We thank you for this group of ladies that we have together tonight. Uh, we wanna thank everybody for joining us for this very special talk. Um, we ask Creator to be with us as we uh, progress throughout this hour, open the hearts, of my, hearts and minds of all who are listening so that we can um, it, uh, hear what is being said, absorb that knowledge, and uh, help others in a good way. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, I can get us started then on sort of introducing the topic, giving a little history of what missing and murdered Indigenous women is, if uh, this is a completely new uh, topic for folks that are here. So MMIW stands for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. Um, that was a movement that was started actually by First Nations people in so-called Canada uh, a, a couple decades ago. <clears throat> and it was essentially a call for, a cry for help um, to address the disproportionate extreme violence against Indigenous women um, that uh, wasn't being tracked uh, in data. Um, so they may, that may not seem like a big issue to like not track data, but the thing is people don't think something is a problem unless there's statistics that back it up. And so uh, when there's thousands and thousands of indigenous peoples that go missing in a year um, and there's no data that shows that, then the, the issue is obsolete. It's not, it, it doesn't exist in the data, it doesn't exist in the media, and therefore it doesn't exist. And so the movement basically uh, started um, this recognition that there's been a chronic lack of data gathering, data gathering specifically for the murders and disappearances of indigenous peoples in so-called Canada. And so they started that movement, the MMIW movement, um, where they broke out in the streets, had a bunch of protests, uh, uh, popularized uh, the acronym so that there can be a, an awareness. Um, and so the United States actually picked up on the movement because uh, indigenous peoples in the US were like, we are also experiencing the same thing. And so, um, the organization that I work at, Sovereign Bodies Institute, is uh, the first organization that created a missing and murdered Indigenous women database. And that started about five years, literally started um, in a Panera Bread Cafe with uh, the executive director and founder, Anita, of our organization, because she's actually a survivor of trafficking and uh, different violences herself. And so it was really like a personal passion project. She acknowledged that there had been a chronic lack of data gathering and thus started a database just in an Excel sheet, essentially. Um, and in about two years ago, uh, she launched Sovereign Bodies Institute to, um, uh, expand on the database, so not just include women, but also look at two-spirit people, um, to look at men and boys, uh, and kind of observe the data and provide data that uh, Indigenous communities could actually use to talk about this issue that continues to happen. And so um, the MMIW was really centered around that, but what it has become um, is an awareness for the many things that maintain MMIP, which is missing and murdered indigenous peoples. So all of indigenous peoples. Um, uh, what was I gonna say? Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, so, sorry, one second, I'm gonna check my notes. Oh yeah, sorry, things that maintain missing and murdered indigenous peoples. And so not only was it a chronic lack of data gathering, but they were able to like observe what are, what are reasons why data is not being gathered. And so one of the main reasons is jurisdictional issues. I'm talking specifically about, about the United States. Um, and so there's certain legislation that helps like maintain and facilitate uh, violence against, against Indigenous peoples. Oh, this is what I wanted to say, is that MMIP is basically a fancy way of saying ongoing genocide against Indigenous peoples. Um, and so uh, with that awareness, 
they've been uh, people who are advocating in the MMIP movement are starting to make connections to what is like maintaining this genocide. And so on top of the lack of data gathering, there's jurisdictional issues. So for example, uh, there was a Supreme Court decision between Oliphant and the Suquamish tribe, which basically rendered if there is violence or a crime that occurs in majority of indigenous territories by a non-native stranger that comes into the land, that that violence cannot be, that person cannot be prosecuted against by the tribe. That tribal jurisdiction cannot protect people from non-native strangers that come to the land. So literally me as a non-native to this continent, I could go into a reservation um, and murder somebody and walk away clean because the tribe does not have jurisdiction over me to be prosecuted to be prosecuted in their lands, which is um, which is pretty huge. Because if you were to go to Italy, for example, you would be under Italy's laws, but, but tribes don't even have the sovereignty or jurisdiction to do that. Majority of them, there have been small legislations that have uh, helped alleviate. Um, uh, that that lack of like sovereignty, but it is still a really big issue. Um, so because of jurisdictional issues, the federal the federal government or the tribal police or the local police, nobody knows whose issue it is if somebody goes missing. And so people are confused. But what happens within the first 48 hours of somebody getting miss going missing means that they potentially can die. And so the 48 hours are crucial. If there are jurisdictional issues and nobody knows how, who who is in charge of supporting that case, then more likely than not, they will die. And so that is why the numbers are so high. Sovereign Bodies Institute in the past five years, we've documented over 4,000 names um, in both Canada and the US. And that represents over 400 tribes. And so uh, it's, um, it's, it's an ongoing issue. Um, I'm not sure if we should show the, the data right now, Jacqueline, or do you want to wait for that? Yeah, if you would like to. Okay. Yeah, we can show that just so I can give a little like, so people can kind of see the context of really the impact. Okay. And while you're talking, or while you're getting that up, um, I wanted to say too, uh, I had mentioned before that my focus in grad school was looking at extract, extractive industries and the connection between them and the violence against indigenous peoples. And so um, that is another thing that helps maintain uh, MMIP or genocide against indigenous peoples because of those like jurisdictional issues. So for example, if a pipeline is put down in a reservation, in order to build the pipeline, they'll bring man camps. And man camps are usually hundreds to often like tens of thousands of non-native men that go to the reservations and they're in these camps. And so when that happens, the, the, the rate of gender and sexual violence like skyrockets. And I actually um, have worked with people that in communities where a pipeline is going through. And uh, for example, I worked with a community um, where they had just approved a pipeline and they're building man camps. And within three months, they had 16 middle school, middle school girls go missing. And so it is, a, it, it is an automatic like effect. And so um, that's another thing. So the lack of data gathering, the jurisdictional issues, the extractive industries, and then the legislation that continues to maintain it. Um, and so Jacqueline's gonna pull up the more specific data. Am I able to share my screen? I think your co-host. Yes. Okay. Right. <clears throat> so this is just the well, did you want to explain this graph, Jacqueline? Yes. Let me. I'm trying to fix the view for everyone. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot fix the view right now. Um, could somebody help me out with the view? 
I think it's that little button to the left of the zoom at the bottom of the screen um, in, in your uh, PowerPoint file or in your PowerPoint window. Okay. What where button? It says, where it says 121% to the left of that, there's a little thing that looks like a easel. There you go. Okay. You got it. Okay. Uh, would you like me to start with these stats, Chelsea? Yeah, that looks good. So these are California stats from the SBI database. Um, before we get into that, uh, what are database tracks? What the SBI database tracks is the first and last name, um, Indian name translation, tribal affiliation, location, date of event, like when the person went missing or when the person was murdered, uh, victim, birth date, age, um, status, if they were missing or murdered, if it was, went into a court system, the race, gender, if there's a reward out, violence done, if the victim was a mother, um, are relevant keywords. So this is a multiple data source. Uh, we, sovereign bodies gets their data source, get their, gets their data from multiple sources. So, uh, for example, this shows a map of uh, Urban Indian Health Institute. It shows the major cities where women and girls go missing. And then below that is the reports that are uh, given out by city police. Oh, I'm sorry. And the map after that is what is reported by media. So Sovereign Bodies takes uh, all of these um, information sources to have a more complete view of the um, sources of data. And you can see, if you can go back for a second, you mm -hmm. could just see the huge discrepancy between like the media even and the UIHI data. And so that's like a small illustration of, of what we see. Um, one example is I think the, the first report that came out was there were, um, when we partnered with um, Oh, I can't think of their name right now. But essentially, there were over 5,000 names that we were able to get. And uh, what was reported in federal data was less than 200. And so what, what the public understanding is of the issue is extremely different than what the reality is. And so this map is like a, a microcosm of that. Thanks, Jacqueline. So about the database, so here are some key stats. 55% of the cases are from the US. Victims are from over 400 tribal nations. 5% of cases are reported as involving sexual assault. 12% involve domestic violence. 6% of victims were reported as sex workers. One out of three cases are girls 18 or under. The average age is 27. 69% of those victims are, were in foster care, um, and 41% of those victims experienced sex trafficking or sex wor work. And these are the top five states of missing and murdered Indigenous people. They're all uh, Western states. Would you like to talk about this one, Chelsea? Actually, I think that's enough data, but I do want to go back one, just one more time. So even uh, the one out of three cases are girls under 18 and under. Um, so that's really significant. The, like the uh, hypersexualization of indigenous women, indigenous girls is, has a huge impact. And even like, um, I don't know if, I'm sure all of you have heard the story of Pocahontas. Pocahontas is actually the first known MMI missing and murdered indigenous girls case that Disney basically romanticized and um, to, like things like that in the media are what uh, are what perpetuate this hypersexualization of indigenous girls. And so that that statistic is really significant. And Pocahontas, the story of Pocahontas is really significant. I, I suggest that you look into that a little bit more because she was actually only 12 or 13. And then I don't think, I think that's, that's a good enough amount for today. 
I think that we could actually transition maybe into whatever you wanted to talk about in terms of like your personal relationship to the movement and your own survival. Sure. So um, at Sovereign Bodies Institute, I was a, I'm no longer working there anymore, but um, I was a services advocate. So I helped uh, women who were survivors of violence and families who, um, whose loved ones were missing or murdered indigenous peoples. I helped them um, by providing services like finding them food, shelter, safety, um, therapists. And I also facilitated uh, talking circles and art therapy groups. Um, so indigenous in systems of helping still exist throughout our communities. And there are many types of traditional healing modes. Um, different tribes and communities have their own traditions and ceremonies. So traditional forms of healing, um, including sweat lodge and pipe ceremonies have sometimes been combined with uh, psychological interventions. And um, these methods seek a deeper healing of spirit and soul based on the beliefs that human nature is spiritual and consciousness is multidimensional, which is um, really embedded in indigenous culture. Um, so there are many different ways that we can find healing within the Native community. Um, there's multiple stressors and traumas that um, afflict the, this population. That combined with colonialism really um, has a um, deep a, there's a there's a deep healing that needs to be done. So um, for me, I was able to reach out to the um, women that I helped in my groups. Um, as I said, I'm also a survivor of violence. And um, at one time I could have easily been a missing or murdered indigenous woman myself. I grew up on reservations in California and I became very independent at a young age. My mother had four children and I remember feeling like a burden. So I always wanted to move out on my own. Um, at the age of 16, I did move out on my own. I got a place with my friend and from that age on, I chose how to live my own life. I got my GED as soon as possible, dropped out of high school at 17 and enrolled in college. I moved to New Mexico where I would spend the majority of my uh, 20s living as a broke artist in Santa Fe. I attended the Institute of American Indian Arts and I survived out there. Um, one night I decided to uh, have a party and early, and it was a party where like um, I had a bunch of friends over from school and they, my friends had invited friends and there was drinking and stuff. And um, I remember early the next morning I woke up as the sun was rising and I was surprised that there were still people there. And I had found that all of my friends had left the party except for two strange men. Uh, one was native and one was white. The native man was actually a cop who worked for the Phoenix Police Department in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and his friend, I didn't know him. And um, anyways, I was telling these men that they had to leave my house because it was time to go. Um, I wanted to clean up. And uh, one of the men didn't like me telling them that they had to leave. Once I turned my back, um, I was hit over the head by what I believe was a lamp. Um, he hit me over the head so hard that I, I was knocked out. When I came to, there was blood coming out of my, out of my head. Um, I remember looking down, he had ripped open my shirt and blood was collecting my bra. Um, I remember thinking that this man was going to kill me. 
um, you know, he dragged me down my, my hallway by my hair. He took me into my bathroom. He told me what he was going to do to me. Um, I knew that I had to talk my way out of it. The cop had left and told him to clean up before he came downstairs and that he was going to wait downstairs in the car for him. Um, when I was in the bathroom with this man, I was on the floor. I had somehow talked him out of hurting me. And I told him like, you know, I had been drinking the night before the blood was really thin because of the alcohol in my blood. And it's just, a, if he got me a towel and a first aid kit, I'd be okay. I wouldn't call the cops. And for some reason, this man listened to me. So he dropped me. And as he went to go look in my closet for the first aid kit and towel, um, I took off running out the front door and I ran to my neighbor's house and they called the cops and they called the ambulance. And because I didn't know who this man was, I wasn't able to give them a name of who did that to me. So this man got away with almost killing me, you know, and like there are so many um, situations when I look back on my life, like being young in my 20s, I put myself in these um, situations like that that were harmful and almost seemed like innocent at the time. but it's really easy for women to find themselves in those situations, especially, um, you know, as women, we have to look out for ourselves and especially women of color, we must be aware of the danger that is out there. So when I got hired for Sovereign Bodies Institute, I was able to facilitate these um, therapy circles because I had lived through similar experiences um, as the women in the groups and I had survived, um, some pretty harsh things in my life. So it's, it became, um, a commonality and something that I had in, I had, um, similarities with these women through the circumstances that I lived through, through that, I was able to secure their confidence and we were able to have um, successful therapy circles. What we did in those circles was we would talk about, um, you know, events um, that sometimes they would just check in for the week, but the, the, the therapy was that uh, we would bead um, we've, we would do like a cultural activity and then talk about, talk about issues, talk about things that were going on in our lives or, um, just checking in, you know, it's good to check in. And so that was my little personal story, uh, just to give you a little bit of, um, of background on me. Um, And Chelsea, did you want to? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Jacqueline. I've actually um, never heard that story. So um, just as a friend and somebody who has a lot of affection for you, I appreciate you sharing that and being vulnerable with us. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, things that uh, I've been doing for, for the past uh, five or six years in MMIP, just so you can kind of see um, through my experiences what Indigenous communities are actually doing. Um, and so uh, when I say work with MMIP, I mean that can be awareness, that could be intervention, uh, prevention of violence, um, any of those things. And so um, like I said, in grad school, I was really looking at the extractive industries um, and that relationship to violence. Um, in my own homelands of Mindanao, uh, there's a direct correlation between uh, missing and murdered indigenous peoples and the corporate uh, extractive industries that are there. So there's like open pit mining, there's logging, there's um, there's, uh, there's things that are damming of rivers. There's a lot of things that are happening where indigenous peoples are protecting the land um, and corporations have uh, paramilitary groups that go and kill the indigenous people so that they can get to the land and then do these, these projects. And so that's actually not an uncommon story for indigenous peoples. Like in, in this continent, for example, I already gave you an example of a, of a pipeline or even Dakota Access Pipeline is a very um, a known issue. Um, and uh, 
that was an example of violence against indigenous peoples that was centered around violence against land because indigenous peoples are embodiments of earth. And so when there's violence against the earth, there will always be violence against indigenous peoples that is connected to it or follows it. Um, and so that was in grad school. Right after grad school, I worked with my community partner, which was an indigenous, um, an indigenous grant making organization. Uh, and I led this, uh, this program that specifically supported indigenous women grassroots groups that addressed MMIP. And so there were groups that were doing research like Sovereign Bodies Institute was one of, was one of our projects. Um, there's groups that did advocacy and like work toward coming up with like legislation or having like task forces that had families and survivors be involved in the process of really determining how to protect their communities from this violence. Um, there were emergency crisis centers uh, and shelters that were culturally, uh, uh, what is it called, like culturally guided, kind of like the groups that Jacqueline's talking about. Um, and there was also like other angles where people really, um, I think somebody had talked about reproductive justice in the beginning um, as one of the topics that y'all have discussed and uh, the uh, indigenous midwifery and reproductive justice movement that's like that's been happening for a couple of decades I, I was able to work with people there so to me that's like prevention um, after that I worked for a local native uh, mental health organization where I supported youth uh, youth work and um, more specifically we built a program around food sovereignty and that was basically just cultural activities that uh, got youth connect reconnected to the land. So there's like fishing or uh, building a smokehouse or um, having gardens um, and things like that. And then most recently with Sovereign Bodies Institute, I was hired on as the program coordinator of Two Spirit and Indigenous Queer work. Like I mentioned, I'm a, I'm a trans indigenous person. And so a lot of my focus has been um, uh, expanding on the database that complements missing and murdered Indigenous women that's specific to Two-Spirit people. Um, that work is really difficult because like Jacqueline showed in that map, if I try to go to those resources, a lot of uh, trans and Two-Spirit people are not actually represented. Um, they're not represented with their identities in those material, like online and media or with a uh, with cop files, police files, um, they're either like dead named. So they have like, they'll have like their given birth name on there um, and not the name that they were known as or the name they chose um, or their gender is not like accurately reported. And so it's actually really hard for me to determine whether or not somebody is two spirit because the people, including their family are also like dishonoring them even in their death. And so tracking that data is actually really difficult it's already difficult to track uh, indigenous women, men and boys, but it's like an extra layer when it comes to two spirit and indigenous queer people because of those um, inaccurate reportings. Um, and then I also do support work like, uh, like Jacqueline's talking about where we uh, basically try to get resources out to any trans or two spirit people that, that are survivors of violence um, and so I, I do a lot of work in services. I would say like 90% of that is services. My work with Sovereign Bodies Institute is services. And that's probably because of my social work background and uh, my experience with human services. Um, and uh, and to be honest, I actually am also leaving Sovereign Bodies Institute. My, my last day is next week. And I say this to say that, you know, doing this work, it's not romantic. It's like, it's really messy. It's hard, it's personal um on so many levels and uh people can get burnt out i'm i'm definitely burnt out and so i need to take a little break um but you know there's there's always like younger generations that are ready to take the baton and and keep the movement going um but i wanted to say that because um i don't know i just feel like i've, I've been in spaces before where we talk about this and it's kind of like wow what an exciting thing and it's like actually it's not we're just saying that it's ongoing genocide that has happened since columbus lost his way you know like so 
this is this has been going on for a very long time for 500 years now um and so it is really helpful when people become more informed like the fact that all of you are interested to even know about what's going on um is like really helpful because the more people know those networks of knowledge continue to grow which means the networks of resources continue to grow and then we begin preventing this issue and so um i just wanted to extend my thanks um the 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 last kind of part before we can go into questions is uh, there's ways to support the movement. Um, Jacqueline, actually, did you want to say that, or do you want me to go down this list? Uh, you can go down the list if you'd like. Okay, um, they're just like pretty simple things. The first one is educate yourself. Not, in, I'm not trying to be patronizing or anything. Like there's a lot of materials and resources out there. There's a lot of people doing good work um, and you could just learn from their stories uh, instead of like um, asking indigenous peoples directly to teach you. There's already resources out there um, that, can, that can help inform you a little bit more. Um, native authors, resources, sites, even with Sovereign Bodies Institute, that's a really great place to start because, uh, like I said, it's not only a database gathering uh, organization, there's webinars there, there's reports that we put out, there's all of that on our website at sovereign-bodies.org, and so you could even start there to just learn a little bit more. Another thing is, uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of the land back movement, but that's also in conjunction with missing and murdered indigenous peoples, which is the literal return of land and the, uh, the uh, what is it called, the decision making power of indigenous peoples and tribal sovereignty to take care of the land how they see fit, including all the non human and human relatives that are tied to that land. Um, I would even just look up hashtag land back if you don't if you don't know about that movement. Um, speaking out against extractive industries, uh, I think it was Anita who told me the story of um, there's this there's this lady who um, is non-native and just wanted to know what to do to help, and she was like, "Well, I can't remember who they were fighting against at that time, but basically this lady." She, you know, she was a stay at home mom. And so she just called and called and called every hour and like uh, interrogated this like media source to do something. And eventually they did something <laughs> they, like did a whole article and like listened to her. And so it's like there's things that people can do to like irritate the people in power to like uh, amplify issues and get resources out. And then the last thing is uh, Native organizations to, to support. Um, we actually have a list, me and Jacqueline put a list together that we're not gonna read, we're just gonna give it to Moni and then she can share out to, to the league. Um, but yeah, and so uh, I think now we're available for any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, Wendy posted that list in the chat if you'd like to look at it. So can I see who has questions? Um, I have a whole bunch of questions, but I'm gonna start with other people first. Are there people in the audience and be sure to unmute yourself if you're asking a question. Does anyone have a question? I have a question or a couple okay. of questions. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I, I knew this was an issue, but I'm very ignorant about it. So thank you so much for sharing all this information. Um, I, I guess my question is like, so are there, depending on what reservation you're on, are there different laws? I mean, do you have anything like some states have stand your ground laws? Can, can you defend yourself in situations where your person is being attacked by a non-Indigenous person? I think it all depends. Um, it depends on the state. Um, it depends on, like in California, we have PL 280. So if you're a California Native American, um, PL 280 means uh, that, uh, let me see, let me, let's see. Crimes involving a Native American who are prosecuted by the federal government and our tribal government are the nature of the crime. And if that crime was um, was 
was done by a non-Indian, like it depends on if they're non-Indian or not. So if they're non-Indian, then the tribe, then the tribe doesn't have any jurisdiction over that. But if they were native, then the tribe would have jurisdiction over that. So it's just really convoluted, hard to keep track. And many of the agencies and the uh, law enforcement organizations, they don't even know whose jurisdiction it is. I'd like to add to that, if I may. Um, Wendy, uh, tribal land is held in trust uh, by the federal government. So am I muted? Can you guys hear me? I'm good. So uh, technically jurisdiction falls under the FBI unless there's an arrangement otherwise. <laughs> Yes, and I wanted to add too that uh, there's like the Violence Against Women Act, which continues to be reauthorized. And so one of the reauthorizations was that if there, if the non-native uh, was a partner of somebody who's native, then uh, then the partner does have protections because of the relationship. Um, but a lot majority of, uh, from what I have found, majority of like the sexual and gender violence that happens by non-natives is by non-native strangers. However, in places like Alaska, I did a lot of work in native Alaska, um, where colonization is a little, uh, it's like fresher. They were like one of the last places to be um, colonized. And also their, their living, uh, their environment, their living environment is extreme like uh, the Arctic and the islands are the two most rapidly affected places by, by climate change. And so like, for example, they have over, I think 200, uh, I'm getting the continent confused with Alaska, but I wanna say like, let's say 250 tribes in Alaska, about 200 of them are only accessible by plane or boat. And so if there was a crisis that happens, um, often it would take days for people to come out and like go and see like about the violence. And so often like, so in places like Alaska, majority of the violence is actually intra-community. It's within the community. Whereas in the continental US, majority of that violence, that stranger, that violence is stranger violence. And so the, like the reauthorization of VAWA didn't, doesn't really help, but it would help in places like Alaska, if that makes sense. Well, Lonnie, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, what is what does the term extraction? You know, you use. Uh, I don't remember which one of you said extraction industry. What What does that mean? Oh, my apologies. Thank you for the question. So, extractive industries to extract is to take from, and so industries are corporations that. Uh, corporations that take away resources, natural resources. So it could be uh, pipelines that take oil. It oh. could be uh, mining sites that take coal. It could be uh, dams that, that stop the water. Those are extractive industries. The industry part means that it's a part of a corporation. Okay. Well, so that, large that explains it. Yeah. 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 They're extracting resources. Okay. Right. Does someone else have a question? So I would like to talk to the two speakers and Moni, please help me because I don't know any of the details because I didn't know I was gonna be talking about this. So this is a League of Women Voters program, but we certainly wanted to work with American Association of University of Women. And obviously we wanted to work with Long Red Line because of Moni, but with AUW and here's Moni where I need you to help me with some details. So AUW did have a program uh, in the last couple of years with an indigenous woman from Alabama who introduced us to this topic. So this is not totally new to us. What is so frustrating to me is hearing you say some of the same things and it's been two years, we're not fixing things. So at some point we need to talk about that. But the other thing, uh, Moni, um, I was interested when they said they were from the Bishop area because I didn't know that. So the two women who we had speaking from the Bishop area before on water, can you tell them who they are? Because they may know who I'm talking about. I think, uh, Jacqueline, it's Terry Red Owl. And the woman down, uh, she's um, 
Oh, her name's escaping me, but Monty Bengosha uh, dressed because he's uh, Bishop's histo tribal history. His I don't know. I can't re recall the actual um, the actual title, but yeah, that that uh, Jacqueline would know them. I, I'm sure if she she. It's actually her mother who who told me about. Uh, and so what I am enjoying is the synchronicity of all this, how we're trying to learn more. Uh, I have a couple of questions because I'm a league person, I think laws. So is it more likely that this is going to get helped with state legislation, with national legislation? Is anything being done at any of those levels? Do you want to answer this? And maybe there is no answer. Maybe that's the worst part of it. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know what your opinion is, Jacqueline. And again, we're not experts. This is just, this is us and our own personal and professional experiences with the movement and the issue. Um, I would say that tribal sovereignty is like the only response that I think would be beneficial. And what I mean by tribal sovereignty is like literally giving the jurisdiction and decision-making rights to the tribes to, to determine how they will protect themselves, what laws, uh, what, what, what does justice look like for, for the situation? How do people handle grief? Like what are people allowed to do in, in those moments of like hurting or ongoing hurt? Like that's what I mean by tribal sovereignty is giving all of all the tribes the right to determine all of that. And so I don't even know if it's a federal, state, or local issue. I just think it's uh, a land back issue. Ruth, do you have a question? You're muted. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this was very informative and um, the part I think that surprised me and I and hadn't thought about is the extracted um, um, industries. Um, I'm with a group of people that um, many of them are Canadians and many of them are from the West Coast. And um, I know the Canadians have talked quite a bit about this. And so my question, who's further ahead at getting things changed? Um, the the Canadians or those of us in the in the U.S. Where, I mean, it, it is one one country. Does one country have a better better handle on it, or are we all just way behind? <laughs> Jacqueline, I mean, that's a tricky question. <laughs> like. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't know, Jacqueline. You can take this one, Jacqueline. I would say they're both pretty far behind. Yeah, um, yeah definitely far behind. What I think really stands out is that we're starting to collect our own data. Native, um, Native people, Indigenous peoples are starting to collect their own data. So that's a start right there. Um, there are there have been acts and different things that have been passed lately. Biden passed um, something with Deb Holland, and these these acts that they're passing, we haven't seen anything come from that. Um, there was an act that was passed. I forget what it was called. Maybe Chelsea can remember. But what they were doing was giving police departments stipends to train their uh, police department better. Yeah, Operation Lady Justice. So they would give 20,000 to a police department. This is how you deal with native people. This is how you investigate these crimes, you know, giving them training. But um, really nothing has come. Yeah, that was with the Trump administration, not Biden. But nothing has come of it. And um, police departments have to sign up for that themselves. And if they don't think there's a problem with it, which there's a lot of systemic racism in the police departments and other things happening there. So um, it's up to them to reach out with the Operation Lady Justice to get the extra help. But uh, yeah, it, there's a lot of red tape and we have a long way to go. I have two more questions for you at least, but I'm gonna start with the first two. So Chelsea used a term that I have never heard before. You said so-called Canada. 
that must have a meaning for you. Why do you use that term? And it's okay to answer any way that you're comfortable with. No, that is an astute observation. Thanks, Jennifer. <laughs> um, I, it's just in my practice to try and call names by their indigenous or ancestral names. And so if I'm saying a colonial name like Canada or the Philippines, I'll say so-called or colonially named. Just, it's just been my practice for a few years now. That's all. <laughs> I'm looking to see if anybody else has a question. I have another question then. So um, the league is nonpartisan. We deal with issues, but I'm gonna ask among us girls, <laughs> uh, did having Deb Howland named, do you think that's going to help? And, and I don't mean that in a, in a confrontational way, I mean, how much power does she have? And, and, and do you see that as, oh gosh, now we have a voice. Can we be more hopeful? And if I'm putting you on the spot, you don't have to answer. <laughs> um, I think that ha having Deb Holland there definitely helped to bring some of the issues to the forefront, but as far as getting things done, um, I haven't seen much movement in the way of that, but it does help to have a native representative in the White House, one that's as outspoken as her. And I think that it overall helps the movement. And Moni, I'm gonna put you on the spot um, because I count on you for so many things. The rest of you don't know how much I depend on Moni, but I depend on her for so many things. But are there things that we haven't touched on that because you know Long Red Line, because you know AUW, because you know League, are there things that we should be asking that we haven't asked? Hmm. You didn't know there was gonna be a quiz. <laughs> no, no, I guess, you know, directly related to Long Red Line uh, um, and the work that we're doing, uh, bringing awareness to the Chicagoland Northwest region. Uh, I think it's important for the uh, people to understand that uh, I-90, I you know, uh, is one of the biggest pipelines, different pipelines, uh, different pipelines for human trafficking. And um, what I was so drawn to Sovereign Bodies was about the data aspect and what they the work that they've been doing, because we don't, um, um, you know, last month we had the human trafficking uh, uh, speaking engagement, and I think um, uh, the response was that people really didn't know that Elgin, of which you know, uh, you guys uh, that that I ninety runs through, that this is happening uh, right in our back doors. Uh, so even though the data is that um, Chelsea and, and Jacqueline have shared with you talk uh, highlight the western part of the country, um, you know um, that we have native sisters and relations going through Algin, you know, because it is the direct route to Chicago, especially coming through, uh, you know, I ninety coming through Montana, and um, you know, so does that come through? Any? Okay. I'm not, but you know, you come through these these Western states that have, uh, um, what's the new word for the day? Extraction uh, uh, pipelines, as you mentioned, Dakota pipeline, Dakota access. That that actually uh, was uh, was to end, I believe, in Piatone, Illinois. So, um, I I am grateful for for the interest that the League and AUW has in all of these uh, very, uh, um, and I encourage you and I, uh, uh, to continue as, just, I, I'm not sure if it was Chelsea Jackson said to, you know, learn, learn more. What's your head? Don't, don't stand up. Um, so I'm very appreciative for Jacqueline and Chelsea to be here. I think I, I learned a lot. I, this was uh, the first time I heard Jacqueline's story. Um, so thank you. Thank you. I don't know. <laughs> I would like to just um, say thank you. I, um, I don't know if you're familiar with a program called Great Decisions, but they've had uh, two years ago, they had um, 
a whole chapter on human trafficking. And this year, there's another one. And uh, the two years ago, there was, um, I was in Arizona and they had um, a, a woman come that with, she worked with, um, uh, with human trafficking and she gave out a lot of information and, and they, were, they were very active in doing this. Um, you know, um, working on real cases. Um, and the other groups that I've been in, there are more men than women. And so this is always a wonderful opportunity because um, the men need to be educated <laughs> and know yeah. what's going on. And uh, so you've given some wonderful information and believe me, they're gonna get their um, lessons. <laughs> the next time I'm on a, on a group with them. So, so thank you. So we lost Chelsea, but I want to thank Jacqueline. I want to thank Moni. And we need to sort of wrap it up. I'm going to talk to you about our next program, but then Moni, if you would like, I'm going to give you a minute or two to talk about Long Red Line and what's coming up. But before we do that, I would like to talk about the league's next month program. Uh, because we're in February, it means the date's going to be the same. It'll be March 9th. And uh, one of the things that the league is concerned about is climate change. And so our next program is um, just in time for spring gardening preparations. The program is called Start in Your Yard, presented by our local version of Wild One. So we hope to see you all then. Thank you, Jacqueline. Be sure to thank Chelsea. But Moni, would you like to say anything to this particular group about upcoming Long Red Line events? Because they're coming right up, aren't they? Yes, as you uh, we moved from the throughout the month of April for Long Red Line. For those of you who may not be aware of what Long Red Line it, yeah, for those of you who may not be familiar with Long Red Line, it falls under one billion, the worldwide movement addressing violence against women. Uh, did I say that one billion rising? Um, so Long Red Line is the local contingent, LGIP contingent. And so we have partnered with the, the uh, is it city of Schaumburg, I believe, uh, as the sister city. And so we're doing events in partnership with uh, Side Street Studios and Trickster Culture. Um, if you would like to keep up to date, uh, please, Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone who attended. Thank you who are watching us on YouTube. Uh, certainly look us up as organizations. We welcome new members. We welcome the effort that you wanna to put to solve these problems and we hope to see you next month. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Good night, thanks. Good night. Good night. Thank, you. Good night. thank you very much.